Hi, it's Scott Averick from the Medical Evidence Blog. I wanted to follow up my last video podcast, uh, which talked about uh, non-inferiority trials with yet another video podcast about non-inferiority trials. Uh, this one will relate to a particular article from uh, JAMA, June 16th, 2015, Solomon et al., the trial that compared uh, appendectomy versus antibiotics alone for the treatment of acute appendicitis. And I've uh, titled this talk, uh, Hiding the Evidence in Plain View, uh, or in plain sight, uh, because, well, you'll see. But before we get to the actual results, this won't be an entire journal club on the article. I'm just going to highlight the results and how they fit in to the framework of the interpretation of non-inferiority trials. Uh, before, before we get to that, uh, I want to refresh the consort figure one that uh, we went over last time. So according to consort, and New England Journal does it like this, um, also pretty much uniformly, if uh, you have uh, new is on the left, so negative differences uh, favor the new therapy and positive uh, absolute risk differences or hazard ratios above one favor the old therapy. So if you have a, uh, here is uh, unity, either hazard ratio of one or absolute risk difference of zero. Here is the pre-specified margin for non-inferiority, for example, 10% delta. So if your confidence interval uh, if your point estimate falls here and your entire confidence interval excludes uh, the uh, uh, an absolute risk difference of one, for example, you have a statistically significant result in favor of the new therapy and you can declare non-inferiority. However, if your upper 95% confidence interval uh, extends past the pre-specified margin for non-inferiority, you have not excluded the possibility of these differences here greater than the, the delta value uh, and so you can't declare non-inferiority, you have an, an inconclusive study. Interestingly enough, and this is where I vehemently degree, disagree with consort authors, if you have a statistically significant result, entire 95% confidence interval falls to the right of uh, uh, unity, uh, older statistically significantly better, but you can't call it, uh, you can't call a new inferior unless you have a result where that the entire 95% confidence interval falls all the way to the right of delta, favoring the old or comparator therapy by a margin entirely exceeding delta, at least in terms of the 95% confidence interval. Okay, so this is actually a very useful diagram for trying to understand the, uh, these results, and it's helpful to plot out the results of any particular trial in such a diagram and compare it to the consort figure one statement, Piaggio et al., I forget uh, what month, JAMA 2012. But now that we've reviewed all of that, I've got to erase it. And the reason I must erase it is because JAMA, the journal in which the consort statement for the interpretation of non-inferiority and equivalence trials was published, JAMA allows or forces authors, I'm not sure which, to set up their diagram in exactly the opposite way, where the positive new is better for positive differences, and old is better for negative differences. And so then your margin for non-inferiority then is, uh, so basically this is the thing flipped over, it's the mirror image. And that's fine, you know, I mean, you know, that's, that's just spatial manipulation, chirality, you know, organic chemistry, turn the molecule around in your head, we should all be able to do that, right? But it, it is a somewhat difficult concept to grasp, all of these deltas and confidence intervals. And so whenever you have an arbitrariness like that and how you present the results, it can lead to a lot of confusion. So uh, I'm a little disappointed in that. But uh, so you have delta now on this side, negative differences favor old. And it was a, an absolute risk difference or proportions, A-R-D of the zero in the Salmon et al. trial of antibiotics versus appendectomy for the treatment of acute appendicitis. And so I just wanted to talk about their uh, result. And I really like this uh, study. I was very interested in it when uh, I saw it come across because I thought, wow, this challenges a deeply entrenched status quo or an assumption that we have. When in doubt, cut it out. Uh, if you have to surgically remove uh, uh, offended, uh, offending appendages, source control and sepsis, and so on and so forth, and here these authors are attempting to treat a large cohort of people, the trial enrolled just over 500 patients, 
And they're randomizing half of them to getting just, uh, just antibiotics. And the outcomes were either successful appendectomy in that group or uh, treatment with antibiotics was successful, i.e. there was no recurrence of appendectomy, uh, nor was, uh, or no recurrence of appendicitis, nor was there a need in the, uh, in the following year for uh, appendectomy uh, for uh, symptoms or, or problems associated with the uh, appendicitis. They, these authors in this article chose a pre-specified margin of non-inferiority of 0.24 or 24%. So they're saying as long as antibiotics aren't worse than surgery, uh, and, and I won't get into all of the, the uh, arguments about whether or not this is an appropriate delta. It is uh, given the outcomes since you're, if you fail antibiotics, you're only just going to cross over and get an appendectomy, and maybe it's worth it to save four people from an, appen, uh, an appendectomy to have uh, one guy fail antibiotics and have to go get an appendectomy. We could debate all of that, but suffice it to say that a pre-specified margin of non-inferiority of 24% is quite large, and I'm not quite sure why it was 24 rather than rounding up to 25. It does give a somewhat even convenient number of patients. I think the pre, uh, the, the, the a priori sample size is approximately 500, but it was 24%. And I, I said, all I wanted to do is talk about these results and how you can hide evidence in plain sight. So it turns out that the point estimate for the one-sided 95% confidence interval, so this is a one-sided 95% percent confidence interval, which is the same as a, you know, so alpha is 0 0.10, the two-sided alpha. But that, that's, that's what they did, and, and we'll see the, the implications of, of having done that. It was 0 0.31 with a, was it 0 0.31? No, it was, the point estimate was 0.27 with a lower confidence limit of 0.31. And what was the upper confidence limit? Well, it was limitless. There isn't one. It's infinity. The upper confidence interval is infinity. So notice what problem that creates. How do you get a statistically significant result in this study? The only confidence bound that you have to work with is the lower one. So the only way that you can get a positive result is to push the results over here such that the lower bound of the confidence interval falls to this side of, of unity. And then you have a limitless infinite upper bound again. So this trial can only give a statistically significant result in favor of the new therapy. New as if it, antibiotics are new and the appendectomy is old in some sense. Uh, so this distinction between old and new is uh, uh, brought into the uh, forefront here again because it, it's somewhat of an arbitrary extension or uh, distinction. Would you call, which would you call old or new? Does it, does it really matter? It's, well, but we're calling uh, antibiotics the new therapy for acute uh, appendicitis. So I'll write antibiotics here, and I'll write appy here for appendectomy. Okay, so, uh, but with the data that's presented, particularly with proportions, it's very easy. We can calculate a two-sided 90% or 95%. I'll do, I did 95% confidence interval and see what it shows. Well, in fact, it shows a point estimate, of course, of 0.27. The point estimate's gonna remain the same. And of course, a 95% confidence interval is wider than a 90% confidence interval. So the lower bound now extends out to 0.33. And we no longer go to infinity. We go to, lo and behold, 0.21. So we have a statistically significant result if we do a two-sided 95% confidence interval that is highly in favor of the old therapy appendectomy. It's uh, 0.27 and it excludes all values less than 21% uh, 
in, in, in favor of the old therapy. Now, of course, the consort authors would say that in spite of the fact that we have excluded all differences, all of these differences in here are excluded. 20.999% and less. We've excluded all differences smaller than that, smaller than 21%. But in order to claim the antibiotics were inferior, we would have needed the 95% confidence interval to fall all the way to the left of delta on their chart. It's all the way to the right, but JAMA reverses it for reasons unknown to me. And so it would have to fall all the way to the left, excluding all values uh, greater than 24%. Uh, and I see now that I put 20 uh, 0.27 here, where the 0.27 needs to be over here. 0.27, and then so it's more like 0.21. Just a, a small difference there, but it's 0.21. So we've excluded all of these values. Okay. Consort says that we would need this to claim that antibiotics are inferior, um, but uh, I would say that if we have a statistically significant result that is that big, uh, maybe we should call antibiotics inferior and therefore appendectomy by extension superior. Notice, of course, as we said in the first talk also, all, all I have to do is move this instead of 24. You know, I said 25 is a good round number. Well, 20 is a good round number too. If we'd have made delta 20 and rolled the same 530 patients, we would have had a the entire 95% confidence interval, two-sided lie all the way to the left of the delta uh, thus totally favoring the old therapy appendectomy and declaring um, uh, antibiotics inferior or appendectomy uh, superior. So this is just yet another uh, illustration of how that non-inferiority trials are inherently biased when we allow them to use one-sided confidence uh, intervals that extend towards, the, uh, towards infinity uh, in favor of the new therapy, then we cannot have a statistically significant result that favors the old therapy, okay? We need two-sided confidence interval intervals for that. So we've actually hidden our evidence, our evidence of the inferiority of an antibiotics alone strategy for appendicitis. We've hidden it in a one-sided confidence interval. And we've also, uh, this, this result is allowed to, to come up because of this arbitrary idea that the consort authors have had that we need to have our result fall all the way, both the entire 95% or 90% or whatever confidence interval fall all the way to the, uh, the left of delta in this diagram, whereas uh, in there, uh, we only need any statistically significant result, no matter how marginal, in favor of the new therapy to call inferiority, or to superiority of the new therapy. So it's far harder to, uh, to declare infer inferiority of the uh, new therapy than it is to declare superiority. The entire design is biased, and it's really biased if you use one-sided confidence intervals where you can hide, uh, within which you can hide evidence of non-inferiority. Uh, that uh, uh, completes my discussion of hiding your uh, evidence in plain sight in the 95% or one-sided confidence intervals. Uh, using, of course, the, uh, the very fascinating trial of Salmon and et al. Uh, as uh, the example. Thank you for joining me. Uh, please follow me on Twitter at MedEvidenceBlog, uh, or on I can be found on the blog itself, www.medicalevidenceblog.com. Thanks again.